For a moment there, I was running on the promises of God. But we got up to the balcony, got the recorder turned on. We're already on the internet. Ran back up, got the CD and tape turned on, and back down here. So let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're looking at Acts chapter 15, verses 13 through 18. Acts chapter 15, verses 13 through 18. As you know, chapter 15 of the book of Acts is the Jerusalem Council, the first all-church council where they are gathered together to determine certain issues of apostasy and heresy, things that deal with salvation, things that deal with sanctification. The chief issue that they're discussing is the apostate and heretical views of circumcision as being required either for salvation, that is apostasy, or being required for sanctification, which is heresy. And you recall that as we discussed the issue of circumcision over the last several weeks, we learned seven different lessons. Number one, never think that you're going to get away with something just because you have made a little forward progress. And we talked about sins of omission. Lesson number two is don't think you'll get away with something just because God has called you and given you a new assignment. Think of sins of commission. You just don't get away with sin. No matter what you're doing now, if you've committed sins that you have not dealt with before God, you will come under chastening. Lesson number three was don't think that God will not embarrass you in front of other people because shame is one of the things that he uses to bring us back into line. You will be discovered. Be sure your sin will find you out. And you recall that with Moses, uh, it happened at an inn where God tried to kill him, not in some desert place. Lesson number four, God is serious about his commands to the point of killing you. One of the commands given to Abraham and his descendants through Isaac was circumcision. It was the mark of distinction for the Jewish people. Moses was going to be their leader. God had sent him to go and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he was supposed to set an example. So don't take God for granted and think that you can ignore what he commands that applies to you. That command doesn't apply to you, but that is the principle that we learned there. Lesson five, don't let peer pressure or even your spouse cause you to neglect what God has told you to do. Apparently, as we saw from that context, Sephora, his wife, was the one who opposed the circumcision because of the way that she responded. Lesson six, don't assume that any of the things that God has commanded you to do are little things or insignificant things. They might, in fact, be very big things in the overall plan of God. Circumcision was the outward, visible sign of males who were part of the covenant people of God in the Old Testament. Lesson seven, don't confuse pre-law commands with the law of Moses. We are not under the law of Moses. Circumcision was given before the law as a sign of God's covenant with his covenant people descended from Abraham, although it was restated under the law on a different basis, it did predate the law. And that's part of the confusion and the false teaching that's going on in Acts chapter 15. Uh, it is Jews who have come from Jerusalem who are teaching circumcision as necessary for salvation. And they're trying to impose that upon the Gentiles before the Gentiles can, quote, be saved. But the believing Jews at Jerusalem who attended the council said that it was necessary for them to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. Issues dealing with sanctification. And true believers can be heretics. They can teach division, which is what the word heresis, the word translated heresy, uh, means in uh, all the different contexts where it's found in the New Testament. It's that which causes divisions. Church splits over false doctrine, even when the people who are involved happen to be real believers, but teaching something as a means of obtaining sanctification. Not a means of obtaining salvation, that's apostasy. But it means of obtaining sanctification, that's heresy, distinct things. Theologically, we talked about transdispensational principles, something that may be established at one point in time that continues to remain even when God makes some changes in his household structure or household economy, as he clearly does at various points in Bible history. The term that the New Testament uses for that is dispensations. We saw that the term dispensation simply means household law. And the head of the house can change rules at different periods of time. We gave you several illustrations. For example, the father does not have to have a rule that his five-year-old cannot drive the car during the week, but only on weekends. You don't give that rule to five-year-olds. Uh, he does not have to restrict the three-year-old from getting in from his dates by 10 o'clock p.m. Rules change as children mature. 
Paul specifically says that the law was given to God's people while they were still in the childhood state, and we looked extensively at the book of Galatians, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5, which say exactly that. However, some rules may remain even after the child matures. Some things are trans-dispensational. They extend over the many periods of a child's life, if you will. For example, don't start eating until everyone is at the table and a prayer of thanks is said. Or brush your teeth every day and take a shower so that you don't smell bad. That continues all the way from childhood all the way through adulthood. We looked at a biblical example of how trans-dispensational principles work. For example, God established marriage before the fall of Adam and Eve, and he certainly did not abolish marriage after the fall or any of the principles that he ordained for marriage. One man for one woman for life. Death alone breaks the marriage bond. Moral purity before, during, and after marriage. Headship of the husband who must honor and love and protect his wife. Gentle obedience submission of the wife to her own husband. Heterosexuality, not homosexuality, bestiality, self-gratification, or other perversions, and the list could go on. God established certain order for marriage, and that is trans-dispensational. We talked about how that applied to circumcision. We talked about salvation and talked, uh, gave illustrations, for example, of baptism, uh, paralleling that with the circumcision issue. Baptism has to be one of the issues that uh, the church fights about today. Uh, some teach baptism is necessary for salvation, like the Church of Christ, who has the five different steps that we talked about that say you have to be baptized by immersion in one of their tanks by one of their pastors using a certain formula uh, in order to be saved. They teach baptism for salvation, that's apostasy, and it must be done unto repentance. If you leave any of that out, your salvation didn't take. Others, like the Roman Catholic Organization, teach that it's necessary to baptize babies in order to save the babies, to keep them out of purgatory, uh, to cleanse them from original sin and other such nonsense as that. And so we gave various illustrations of the false doctrines of baptism, even permeating a number of the reform groups, some of the extreme groups today teaching that pedo-baptism and pedo-communion, that is, giving communion, the Lord's table, to infants is necessary for their salvation. And I told you about some of the fellows that I know that are in that movement. I know them personally. Uh, and one of them has actually put out a book on that subject, teaching that you must baptize the child in order to have that child saved, and you must give them communion, even in infancy, because if they die in infancy without baptism and without communion, they go to hell. That's false doctrine. That's apostasy. My point was, the hard issue is the same as Acts 15. Only the symbolic acts are different. The real struggle is with the doctrine of grace and faith. Is salvation by grace plus some man's work, or by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone? And obviously it's by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Then we talked about sanctification, to be set apart for service. And all of this is the background for what we want to look at tonight. That's why I've given you a little bit more extensive review on it. The second group that we looked at in this passage here in Acts 15 uh, gave an illustration of people who taught that works of obedience were necessary for sanctification. You will find that phrase, works of obedience. Uh, and yes, we are supposed to be obedient. Is that what produces sanctification? Emphasis on does it produce it, or is it the result of the Holy Spirit setting you apart and working in your life? Do you work it up yourself by going through the actions and then you are sanctified? Or does the Holy Spirit work in your heart and life to bring you in spiritual growth to a set-apart position whereby you are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh? And we pointed out that there are, we could use those same illustrations, baptism, Lord's Supper, whatever your illustration happens to be. The charismatic movement has a speaking in tongues to prove that you're sanctified. I mean, all kinds of strange things out there that you have to do before you can be sanctified. But the scripture does not teach that. Paul, in fact, himself said that uh, baptism wasn't part of the commission that Christ gave to him when he was sent to the Gentiles, and he clearly baptized, but he makes it clear that that was not necessary either for salvation or sanctification. 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 1 Corinthians 1.17. So we concluded with be very careful when you connect an external symbol to the full Christian life as a necessary requirement. You don't have to have the external symbol to lead a full Christian life. And it doesn't have to be by a particular mode. It's important that you do it because it is obedient. But that's not what produces sanctification. 
Be careful or you'll find yourself back in the debate of Acts chapter 15. We talked about the use of the Lord's table, a very different act, but it still is an attack on grace and faith when it's required either for salvation or sanctification. We talked about the different groups all the way from the Plymouth Brethren to the Super Reformed who look at it as a means of grace, a conduit of grace, something that imparts grace to you borders very closely on requiring it for sanctification. And of course that moves you back toward Roman Catholicism. We could talk about Sabbatarianism, we mentioned that, uh, just put that in in place of baptism, Lord's Supper, circumcision, you know, speaking in tongues or whatever else you want. Uh, those who teach Sabbatarianism, it's a different action by man, but it still is an attack on grace by faith. And I mentioned a number of years ago of one Reformed Baptist family that I knew that only ate cold cuts on Sunday because they considered Sunday to be the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, you could not light a fire on the Sabbath. Ergo, you could not cook on Sunday. Ergo, modern Christians must eat cold cuts on Sunday. Now that's a stretch, you know, moving through that uh, thing. But that's what they did because they were applying Sabbatarian law to the New Testament. They didn't understand the concept of grace and faith. And I have a very interesting co-pastor here this evening. Uh, <laughs> that's quite all right. As he runs around there, just pay attention to this. <laughs> Any teaching that requires any external act of man to obtain salvation or sanctification is either apostate or heretical. Apostasy, which means apostasia, means a falling away, relates to salvation. Heresy, the word hieresis, means divisions. It relates to sanctification. And I gave you a chart last week. I hope you remember it. I'm not going to go over it in detail tonight. But there is Jewish apostate legalism, which requires the law of Moses, or some aspect of the law, such as circumcision, for salvation. There is pagan apostate legalism, which requires some external work performed by man for salvation. Baptism, Lord's table, speaking in tongues, keeping worlds of the church, making pilgrimages to Rome, crawling up the uh, Scala Sancta on your knees, kissing the silver cross in the stairs where theoretically Christ fell. I mean. You can go through the whole list. There are all kinds of works of men that different organizations require for salvation. That's pagan apostate legalism. Heresy relates to the false doctrine of sanctification. Also, we saw there are two parallel types of heresy. Number one, Jewish heretical legalism, which requires the law of Moses, as we see in our text in Acts, or some aspect of the law for sanctification. It is needful for them to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses, verse 5 in our text. Or pagan heretical legalism requiring some external work performed by man for sanctification, and you can go through that entire list that we just gave to you a moment ago. And then I gave a caveat. Many people twist the freedom from the law to deny grace in another way. You can be on the top, walking along the top here, or you can fall off to the right, which is into legalism, or you can fall off to the left, which is in libertinism and licentiousness. And so people say, we're no longer under the law, so therefore we can sin that grace may abound. God forbid, how shall the we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? The freedom from the law is not the right to do what you want. Freedom from the law means the right to do what you ought. And that's very important for us to remember. It is not the freedom to wallow in sin. It is freedom from the bondage of sin. It is freedom from the curse of the law. The law does not save you. The law does not sanctify you. All it does is condemn you. But our freedom comes from the fact that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We are empowered by the Spirit of God to do works that are pleasing to God in obedience to the Word of God and to the glory of God. You cannot do that in the flesh no matter how hard you try. It will never work. In the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God in obedience to the Word of God. God still has a righteous character and righteous standards based on that character, but the approach is different. It's not the law, and it's not libertinism or license. The four types of legalism described in the Bible does not deny holy living. It does not deny the clear teaching of Scripture that the church must have certain order for effective testimony and functioning of the church and a testimony before the world. Rejection of the four types of apostasy and heresy is not a call to approve of libertinism or licentiousness. It does not eradicate the necessity for structure, moral purity, decency, and order which God has ordained for the church. And so we talked about the application to circumcision, and we talked about after the cross, it is not the law that directs us, but the grace of God.
We gave illustrations of that. We talked about Abraham was not saved or sanctified by circumcision because he was saved by faith before he was circumcised. However, he was then circumcised as a sign that he had believed the promises of God. Same with baptism, Lord's table, anything else that you want to name. The key issue is your relationship of, uh, with God by faith. And then we talked about key verses in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We're going to get verse 10 tonight uh, as we go on to that. Works follow salvation. They do not produce salvation. Works are an external manifestation that the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is occurring. Works are not a means of achieving sanctification. Like salvation, sanctification is by grace through faith. And Paul says so specifically in Acts 26, verses 17 and 18. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are, here's the phrase, them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Sanctification is by faith the same as salvation. Sanctification is grounded in the cross. It is not grounded in the work of men. Sanctification is grounded in the grace of God alone. It is achieved by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. Hebrews 10.10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that's a very quick overview from last week. That brings us to our verses for tonight, verses 13 through 18. And after that they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that's Simon Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Remember this issue that's being debated is do we have to require the Gentiles to be circumcised either for salvation or for sanctification? And so here he's quoting Simon Peter who has just given his testimony in the preceding verses. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. That, verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. We'll see where this quote comes from in a moment. Upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Verse 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, and that includes the calling of the Gentiles. God could have, and he did not, but he could have restricted the gospel to the Jews. God made certain choices that in eternity past, that would include you and me here tonight. This church would not exist if God had not had Acts chapter 10 happen with Cornelius and his household. God extended the gospel to the Gentiles. He prophesied that it was going to happen in the Old Testament. That ingathering of Gentiles was first prophesied in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 20, and Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 5. The Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. You all know that particular phrase because you've heard Handel's Messiah. Gentiles shall come to the light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. That's part of the music. Marvelous, fantastic understanding that the librettist who wrote the, chose the passages for Handel to write the music to about the Gentiles coming in. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. That's Isaiah. Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 alludes to this also. And there was given him a dominion. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking here. And glory and kingdom. And this is after Nebuchadnezzar is coming out of his animal state after having talked about how proud and how great he was for building this great Babylon. There was given him a dominion and glory and a kingdom and all people and nations and languages, that's Gentiles, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And of course there are many other passages in the Old Testament that give allusion to the future salvation of Gentiles but that gives you a general representation of them. But he talks about here, as James is speaking and as he is giving the background for the fact that Gentiles are going to come to salvation, he says, and to this agree the words of the prophets. And then James not only makes the general allusions, but he gives a quotation 
This shows you how well these folks knew their Old Testament. I suspect that if I asked any of you tonight to quote some verses out of the book of Amos, you couldn't do it. But that's where this quote comes from. It's Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. And notice something else here, too. We've talked about this in a great deal of detail as we looked at Paul's presentation of the gospel. Whenever he came to a place that there were Jews and a synagogue, he would go in and he would start immediately making a, a, an argument, making a sermon based on their knowledge of the Old Testament. When he preached to the Gentiles, he didn't start there. He started with creation because they had the light of creation. And Paul explains that theologically in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following. But with the Jews, he started with scripture, not starting just with creation. You remember when Paul got stoned, right before he got stoned to death, uh, the priest of Jupiter was trying to come out and offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas because of the healing that had just taken place. And Paul and Barnabas ran in among them, tore their clothes, said, don't do it because we're just men like you are. There's a God in heaven who created everything. They went back to creation because they had a pagan audience who at least would understand that Almighty God is there. He's the one who created everything. To him, we have to give an account someday. That's not the way you worship the true God. But here, we find James quoting scripture. Why? Because he has primarily a Jewish audience. He has the council at Jerusalem. He has those who are leaders in the church at Jerusalem. He has men who have studied the scripture. We have the apostles and we have James and we have some other church leaders there at Jerusalem, elders who have been appointed in the church. And we have deacons who have been appointed in the church. We have a, a group of men who are spiritually mature and who understand the scriptures who are discussing this issue. And so he quotes Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Eden, Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. The heathen are the Gentiles. That's the phrase that's quoted earlier by uh, James in Acts chapter 15. Now, notice verse 18. I want to jump down there for just a second. That verse that says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. I'm only going to spend a few moments on this. But that is a very important verse, and it is a good example of a place where the wretched and defective Westcott Hort Greek texts changes the Greek text underlying the King James translation. The Westcott Hort text omits the entire phrase, unto God are all his works. In other words, it has nothing to do with God and his works in the Westcott Hort text, which results in all the modern translations rendering that verse in a non-intelligible gibberish that has no continuity with the context. I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at all the funny translations that have come out of the wrong text, but uh, if you're having any free time, if you go to a Christian bookstore sometime, just pull one of those modern translations off the shelf, doesn't matter which one you do, and look up uh, verse 18, Acts 15, 18. If you do, you'll be amused to see what the modern translators have tried to do with that verse, not having the Greek text that underlies it. You'll also be amazed at the footnotes, which are so verbose in defending all the variant textual readings that they claim prove that the received text cannot be the correct text. Just ignore them. The correct text reads just like your King James Version states it. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. And that's what brings us to the main point of the message tonight, which is the doctrine of foreknowledge and its connection to predestination and to election. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Now, I've preached extensively on both predestination and election. Predestination is determining beforehand the eternal destiny, destiny of men and angels, all moral creatures, as determined by God. Election is the point of choice. That's the point at which they are individually chosen and placed among that group. And there are different ones called the elect. There are elect angels. There are elect individuals, both Old Testament in relation to Israel and New Testament in relation to the church. Christ himself is called the elect one. There are many different places where that word election or elect is used uh, of different individuals or different groups throughout scripture.
But predestination deals with determining the eternal destiny beforehand, predetermining the destiny, the ultimate destiny of all moral creatures that God has created. But how does that tie in with foreknowledge? As we look at the Arminian view, first of all, that view says that God simply looked down the corridors of time and then as he looked down he saw who would believe and who wouldn't believe and so then God placed his rubber stamp of approval on the ones who would believe and he called them the elect and he predestined men based on the choices that they would make in other words it follows man's choice rather than predetermining man's choice it follows man's choice Thus, foreknowledge is limited to what God simply foresaw would happen. On the other hand, I believe that the biblical view says that God, as the infinite first cause of all things, knew not just what would happen, but God knew all the possibilities of everything that ever could happen. Now, that is an infinite number of possibilities. For example, consider the number of hairs on your head the number that are growing in and the number that are falling out and at some point more will be falling out than are growing in. God could have chosen with one individual to make one more hair grow on his head than he did. I think we'd agree to that. You know what? God didn't. God could have chosen to keep your hair from falling out but he didn't. Think of the billions of people on the planet and their hair. God could have chosen a different hair color for everybody. He could have made all of our hair green, or some of us have green hair, some of us have purple hair. Now, some of the modern teenagers are trying to do that, but uh, the way God made us isn't that way. God could have made us have three eyes, one in the middle of our forehead. He didn't do that. You see, there are an infinite number of possibilities concerning what God could have done, but he didn't because his ultimate purpose was to bring glory to himself. Scripture states that specifically. And everything that we do is to be done for the glory of God. Multiple times in the New Testament we're told that. God chose one of the precise and specific plans of all the plans that could have been. He chose one precise, specific plan because that was the plan in which every action, every activity, every thought, word, every motive, everything about the creation would ultimately bring him the greatest amount of glory. You see, that's the ultimate goal. Now we think of that as selfish because we're sinful creatures. But for the infinite, almighty, absolutely holy, absolutely pure God, it is not at all selfish. All things must bring glory to God. And any other viewpoint is rebellion against what God has revealed concerning himself, concerning his character, concerning his nature, concerning his ultimate goals, which is that he will be glorified in all of creation. Even though we don't understand it, he will be glorified even by sinners. That's a very important thing to remember. You think about the worst sin that men ever committed, and that was crucifying Christ, nailing him to the cross. And yet it was at that point that God gave man his greatest gift. God can take even the most evil and wicked things, though we are not excused for those things. We are held accountable for those things, but he can put it within his sovereign plan so that it ultimately brings him the greatest amount of glory. We don't understand it all. We don't understand the events of life, but we understand that in the end, it will bring God the greatest amount of glory of glory. Think about it for a second. It gives us the correct perspective on the character of God. God was the infinite first cause of all things and God was the one who determined first to act. Nothing at all would have happened unless God acted first. Among those infinite possibilities depending on how and what God created. God could have chosen, for example, not to create Lucifer in his unfallen state, not to create him at all. If we just want the foreknowledge view that says God looked down the corridors of time, God could have said, oh, that's a terrible creature. I don't think I'll create him. I think I will help avoid some of these horrible chaos and problems on earth. I just won't create Lucifer. But God chose to create Lucifer. God created him without sin. 
It's another fascinating study. Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, deal with the creation and the fall of Lucifer. And Lucifer himself is to blame. But God could have, in eternity past, before he did any of creation, he could have said, you know, there are so many other plans out here, I can choose not to create Lucifer. I can choose to create something else. God didn't do it. God could have chosen not to create the one-third of the angels that followed Lucifer. He chose Lucifer and let him fall, but he could have chosen not to create those other angels. And then Lucifer would have had a very, very hard time accomplishing anything. All by himself, he's a creature. He can only be one place at one time. He's limited in his power. He's limited in his scope of knowledge. He is a creature. He is not the creator. He tries to be like the creator, but he can't. God could have chosen not to create those other one-third of the angels that would follow Lucifer, just create the holy angels, the ones that would not follow Lucifer. God did not choose that plan. God could have made other choices. He could have eliminated the possibility of having a tempter in the Garden of Eden. He could have either not created Lucifer or just kept him out of the Garden. You see, God was under no obligation to create anything and certainly was not under obligation to create a spirit being who would sin and become Satan. God had no obligation to do that. God could have chosen to create Bork and Zog instead of creating Adam and Eve. He could have made them into, as the 1960s pop music hit says, one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eaters, pigeon-toed, undergrowed, flying purple people eaters. I bet some of you remember that one. But God didn't do it. God created Adam and Eve. He created them with precise responsibilities and with precise abilities. He placed them in a garden that was invaded by a creature that he had already made. He knew precisely what would happen because, not because he was just going to happen, but because he chose to create precise, morally accountable creatures who would respond to their external environment in precisely a certain way. Just like fish respond to their environment of water and land animals respond to air, neither can long survive in the element of the other. Where the Arminian view departs from scripture is this. The Arminian view makes God subject to history rather than making history subject to God. You see, they say God looked down the corridors of history and he elected on the basis of what men would do. That makes God subject to history. Rather than making history subject to God who is the creator and who orders and ordains all things. Even our good works, that is our works of faith, done in the power of the Spirit, to the glory of God, and in obedience to the Word of God, even our good works were predestined by God. That brings us back to Ephesians 2.10. We looked at Ephesians 2.8 and 9 last week in terms of salvation and sanctification by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now we get to verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now listen to the next phrase which God hath before ordained. That's predestined. He ordained them in advance that we should walk in them. Even our good works were predestined by God and also empowered by the Holy Spirit because you cannot do good works in the flesh. The flesh cannot please God. Scripture says so specifically. So either you're walking in the flesh in which case you are not pleasing God, regardless of how externally good your works appear, or you are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and your works are empowered by the Holy Spirit so that the works that are produced in your life, just like fruit, which comes from the, the groundwater soaking into the roots and running up the, the stem of the tree and out into the branches, produces fruit showing the character and the nature of the tree. Jesus talked about that. You can't pick grapes off of some kind of a fig tree, you can't pick you know, berries off of a thorn bush, you are going to see what is the nature of the tree, not because the tree does work, but because there is a certain power that moves through the tree. And the same is true, that's why we call it, or Jesus calls it, and Paul calls it likewise, the fruit of the Spirit. John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus lists all nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul simply summarizes them in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance.
Important to remember that it is not your works, it is God's work. Did you notice that? The Arminian view making God subject to history rather than history subject to God. Listen to what the text says. Listen to it carefully. Acts 15, 18. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. It does not say, say, known unto God are all of man's works from the beginning of the world, although that's an obvious truism. But man can do nothing outside the sovereign will of God. Even our good works, that is, works of faith, done in the power of the Holy Spirit, done to the glory of God, done in obedience to the word of God, those are all necessary parts of good works. Even those were predestined by God, where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Even the decisions of the greatest kings are controlled by the hand of God. Daniel 4, 34 and 35, at the end of days, I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So we know we're talking about the true and living God here. Nebuchadnezzar has had his eyes open in a rather a straightforward and blunt way. Verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? The eternal plan of God. The key issue that's being debated in Acts chapter 15 hinges on that. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He told us about it in the Old Testament. He prophesied it in Isaiah. He prophesied it in Amos. He prophesied it in Daniel. He prophesied it in multiple places where we have this light that's going to come to the Gentiles. And not one of those places say the Gentiles have got to be circumcised or placed back under the law. And so as Peter gives his testimony, it is an authoritative testimony because God chose Peter, the apostle to the Jews, to be the one who brought the Gentiles into the body of Christ. And Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, goes to synagogues first. The middle wall of partition has been broken down. Now there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, and as Peter says, purifying their hearts by faith, and we know that we shall be saved by faith even as they. We would have thought he would have said, well, they'll be saved by faith just like we, but he doesn't do that. We shall be saved even as they. Dear people, remember it. Your salvation is based on grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Your sanctification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Even the good works that you do are predestined by God. In the eternal plan of God, God controls, but man is held accountable. That's difficult for us to put together. We want it to be one way or the other. Either we want us to be automatons, whereby God does everything, and we aren't accountable for anything, or we want to be the ones that are responsible for everything, why God sits up in heaven and bites his fingernails wondering what's going to happen. And he looks down the road and he thinks, oh my, it's going to be terrible down there. Nobody's going to be saved. That's right. If we were responsible, nobody would be saved. Nobody would be saved. For we're all dead, not sick. We're all dead in trespasses and sin before God reaches his sovereign hand down and brings the light of the gospel into our hearts and regenerates us by the Holy Spirit and gives us faith. Faith is the gift of God, according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's hard for us to put that together. It's an infinite concept, if you will. But we believe in the Trinity. That's an infinite concept also. There is one God, 
He exists in three persons. They are not three parts of God. They are a distinct, individual, co-equal persons in the Godhead. They are not merely emanations from God. They are distinct persons in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They all have the same co-equal attributes. They have a divine order in which they function, but they are co-equal members of the Godhead, and yet there is, very clearly taught in Scripture, only one God. Hard to put that together. We have finite minds. To comprehend and wrap around an infinite idea, such as the triune Godhead, is something we believe, and if you don't believe it, you're probably not saved because it means that you will have diminished the person and work of Jesus Christ, which is necessary for salvation. If you only make him an angelic being, Michael the Archangel, for example, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Millennial Dawn groups make him, that he's only a created being, he cannot give you eternal life, for a creature cannot give you eternal life. He could not make an infinite sacrifice on the cross if he's only a creature. Only eternal God could make an infinite sacrifice. He must have the Christ of Scripture. He must be indeed God. For in him, Colossians 2.9, dwelleth all the fullness, the pleroma, of the Godhead bodily. That's Jesus he's talking about. The Holy Spirit is clearly God. Paul makes that clear in Ephesians chapter 20, where he's talking to the elders of the church of Ephesus. Oh, people, how important it is that we understand that there are certain things that we cannot put together with our reason, but it has been given to us by revelation. Whenever you find a conflict between reason and revelation, go with revelation. You may not understand it, but if the scripture says it, it is true. We try so hard to make the scripture fit into our own preconceived molds, into our own preconceived ideas, and I see this kind of struggle going on all the time. I mean, I read theological books and articles and so on and see people trying to twist things to make it fit their preconceived scheme. Don't start with a preconceived scheme. Start with the scripture. It is the word of God that is the final authority. It is not some you know, book of doctrine or, you know, New Testament survey book or something like that. Start with scripture. And if you come to a problem and you look at it and say, I don't understand it, but the scripture says that I'm going to believe it. That's where we begin. It's difficult to understand, but truth is based on revelation. Truth is not based on reason. God gives us reason. He gives us ability to understand things. But the scripture tells us that there are certain things that God has revealed. They belong unto us and our children. There are other things that God has not revealed to us that belong unto the Lord God Almighty himself and him alone. He understands things that we do not. And that's what faith is about. We learn to trust what he said in the word of God. Not make up our own schemes. Trust what he has said in the word of God. And as you do so, you'll find that you have delight and joy and you'll also find that you have solutions to the problems that you face such as the problem that we see in Acts 15 which is an issue whereby grace and faith are being attacked by the law and by human good works both for salvation and sanctification start with the scripture grace alone faith alone Christ alone an eternal sovereign God who works all things, not some things. Ephesians chapter 1 works all things after the counsel of his own will. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the power of your word. We thank you that it is clear. It teaches that you are God and not man. It teaches that you are God, not one of your created beings, such as Satan, who was created as Lucifer. It teaches that there is an infinite, eternal God, not a finite God. It teaches us that there is a God who loves us and cares for us and who has made choices for which we are so thankful. We do not deserve it. It is not something upon which we can become proud and arrogant and haughty because we are among the elect. No, God chose the bottom of the barrel. He chose the worst people. He chose the scum. He chose the offscouring because by saving them, it proves that he is great. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God hath chosen the base things of the world and the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Teach us humility. Teach us loving response and joy.
and teach us obedience because we love you, not simply because the law demands it, but because we want to do that which pleases the one whom we love in a holy and righteous way that brings glory to him, to the one who loved us and bought us with his blood. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 540.